Amen. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible reads, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of their ministry. Now the part I want to focus in there is on verse 5 where it says, Be, uh, be thou watchful in all things, and be, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. So he's telling, uh, Paul's telling Timothy here, that he is to do the work of an evangelist. And this is a charge that he's laid up on all of us. And uh, I just want to talk about uh, what it means to be an evangelist or what it means to do evangelism. And specifically what I want to talk about is, is, is a problem that we have in a lot of independent fundamental Baptist churches, and it's that they have an insufficient evangelism. That's the title of the, uh, the uh, sermon this morning. It's an inefficient evangelism. Inefficient evangelism. That's what we see taking place. It's important that we understand what it means to have efficient evangelism, but also it means it's important to understand when we be able to identify inefficient evangelism, because it's a charge that's been laid upon us. If you look there in verse 1, it says, I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, and he goes on and lists these things, and part of that charge is to do the work of an evangelist. So if we're going to do work, if we're going to labor for God, we ought to do it efficiently. And what we've seen today is a lot of people who are very inefficient in their evangelism. Now what does it mean to be inefficient? It means to not achieve, not achieving the maximum productivity, not doing the best you can, not getting a full yield out of what it is you're trying to, to take in. Wasting or failing to make the best use of time or resources. It's, that's what it means to be inefficient. And of course we're probably all here, uh, all here probably are very familiar with the term evangelism. We know that's just the spreading of the gospel uh, by public preaching or our, our own personal witness. That would be evangelism, going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you think about being inefficient, you know, we could all probably relate this to in terms of work. You can imagine if somebody was an inefficient worker at their job, what kind of person would they be? They'd be a person who, you know, lingers a little too long, drags their feet, doesn't walk at a good pace. And we've, we've probably all worked with people like that. They've always, they, they never have that sense of urgency, and they drag their feet from job to job. And I remember I worked with a guy and it just drove me nuts because he always had this, this kind of like saunter everywhere he went. And he'd walk about this fast. And I'd say, I'd be up on a ladder and I'd be working on this, you know, something. And I'd say, hey, go grab that tool real quick. And I'd be, I could have gotten down off the ladder, ran over there and got it quicker than he could have done it. And then he comes back, you know, and they, and they, they hand it to you like this. They don't extend, you know, little things like that. That's what it means to be inefficient, you know, to not use the, not to be uh, efficient. It's not to, um, you know, Put the arm out, walk fast, get it to that guy. You know, that had that sense of urgency. So that's what, but that's something that we can relate also to evangelism. That's what I want to talk about is just some examples of what we see in Baptist churches that they use as a form of evangelism. But when you examine it and you look at it and you compare it to the biblical model of evangelism, you see that it's very inefficient. That it might have some effectiveness, but it's actually very inefficient. Now you're there uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, just stay there, but I'll, I'll, the first one I want to talk about is the bus route. You know, and I, I'm hesitant to pick on this one because, you know, let me just say right out of the gate that it, this is something that I I, uh, that I was a part of for seven years. I was a bus captain, you know, I was very involved. I helped uh, start a bus, pro uh, bus, so bus program uh, at, a, at a Baptist church, and, it, and there are good things about it. I'm not just here trying to rip on it, but the fact is, is that we need to be efficient in our soul winning because it is a charge that's been laid upon us before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think the bus route is probably one of the biggest spiritual crutches that a lot of Baptist churches use today to excuse themselves from actual efficient evangelism. They use the, they use the bus route as an excuse not to do that. Now, if you're not familiar with the bus route and what that is, this is something that was developed and popularized you know, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. It became very popular. And it's just when a church goes out on a Sunday morning with a, 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 a school bus that they've purchased for the church, and they pick up kids in their surrounding area, and they pick up the children, and then they bring them back to the church and have church services for the kids and then take them back. It's pretty simple. But um, it's, it's something that I feel even that has kind of gone by the wayside in, in, in Baptist churches, too. They're not, it's not as popular as it once was. It's still out there. You can find it. 
but it's definitely still very popular in Bible colleges. If you were to go to a, a, a Baptist Bible college, they would probably in all likely have, likelihood have a bus route. And it's the main method used by Bible colleges for obvious reasons. They have the staffing that it takes. They have the drivers, they have the bus workers to go out and do all the work. Because it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of people to run a bus route. They have all the financial resources. And there's a lot of financial resources that are, that are needed in order to run a successful bus ministry. And you think about all the, the curriculum that has to be bought for, the, for on the route when entertaining the kids. And when you get into the junior church and, and the Sunday schools and the, and, the, and the candy and all the promotions that go along with it. And then they have, obviously, they have enough people to run the ministries at the church. I mean, it would be very hard to run a, a bus ministry and then bring them to the church if there was nobody there to take care of them. I mean, they're not going to sit them down in the main service. That's not something that they want to do. So, and just how, it, how does a typical bus route, you know, operate? Let's just look at how, how, that, how it operates. And as we begin to examine a bus route and what it takes to run a bus route, we'll begin to see how very inefficient it is at evangelizing the lost. Not that it doesn't have benefits, not that there isn't some good that comes out of it, but we have to, again, just understand that a bus route, it, it, it falls short of reaching the entire world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It will not accomplish that goal. It will not be efficient means of evangelism. So you would think, first of all, how does a typical program operate? I, I've talked to people about bus routes in the past, and, they, and they're kind of, the people who have, are not familiar with it at all, they, they're kind of struck, you know, taken aback by when you begin to explain to them what's all involved. Because a bus route just isn't Sunday morning. A lot of people, that's what everyone at the church sees when you show up with a busload of kids and, you know, 50, 30, 50, 60, 80 kids sometimes compiling off some bus. And they think, wow, that's great. But what they don't see is the Saturday morning. They don't see the, the laborers going out on Saturdays and working then because that's when the bus program really begins is on a Saturday. When you go out and you start calling and what they call prospecting. You know, and if you think about that word prospecting, that's like what a guy would do when he would go out into the hills looking for gold, right? He'd go out there and he would, you know, look for what, this looks like a place I might find some, some valuable resources, right? And that's exactly what takes place in bus calling. And this is one of the major reasons I think that the bus route is an inefficient means of evangelism. Because it specifically targets a certain group of people, and it's people who have children. Meaning if you do not have children, in all likelihood, your door is not going to get knocked. I don't know how, I'm not, obviously I can only speak from the experience that, that I had with, with the bus route that I was involved with, but I, would, it's, it's, uh, I imagine the way I was taught is, a, is, the, is the way a lot of, is the way it's practiced in many other bus programs, is that people would go out and they would look specifically when, and when I would do it, I would call it a uh, child sign. You would look for the sign of children, you know, you, you know how when you're out tracking an animal, you look for their sign, you know, you would look for like, a rub on a tree if you're looking for an antler deer or something like that. You would look for sign, right? Well, I would call this child sign. You would look for signs of children. You know, you'd go out and go through the neighborhoods trying to build your bus route and do your prospecting. You would look for toys in the yard. You'd look for bikes in the yard. You would look for a yard that has not a lot of grass, maybe. It's been all beaten down. It's turned into a mud hole, right? You'd look for that house that has, you know, footprints all over the front door and crayon and everything like that. And it was pretty obvious which families had children and which ones didn't. You know, so that right there would narrow your, your search down. That you wouldn't talk to, you wouldn't even talk to the other people. You might canvas an area and just let them know what you're doing. You know, in the hopes that maybe there's a child in there that you know doesn't get allowed to go outdoors or have any toys or something, right? But normally, you, that's what you would to be efficient in your bus calling. You would go and you would target specific homes that look like they have kids. So you would approach the door, you know, now imagine this, a total stranger coming to your door, knocking on your door, and asking if he can pick up all of your children the next day on a bus and take them away from you for several hours and then bring them back. And now when I would explain this to people, they would think, wow, and of course I'm speaking to people, you know, who have their guard up, that are a little bit more vigilant about protecting their children. And it's amazing to me what, what blew me away when I started doing this is how many people would just say, yeah, go ahead. They would just, just freely allow just this perfect stranger to pick up their kid. I don't know, maybe I just have a face you can trust. I'm not sure what it is, but they would just let me take, pick their kids up and, 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 and cart them off every Sunday morning, you know, at, at, the, at the break of dawn to some strange building that they've never even been to. 
And the amazing thing, and, and really the motive behind the bus route is, you know, yes, it's reaching children, but really, if you really want to know what the, 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 the inside motive is on a bus route, it's to bring the parents. It's, you know, there's that motto, get the kids and you'll get the parents, right? That's one follows the other. And that's why a lot of these people run bus routes. Yes, they reach the children. They try to give them the gospel if they're preach, even preaching the right gospel and teach them about Jesus Christ. But really the motive is to build the church. It's to bring people to the church. It's to get a family to come out and start coming to church. And I, and I don't know how many families I would... I had children that rode that bus for years. And you would never see their parents unless you had a special day. You know, unless you had the 100-foot Sunday. You know, where you, where you make up an, uh, an ice cream Sunday 100 feet long. And then the parents would show up to take pictures. Or you'd have to have some kind of carnival with pony rides and a bouncy house. And then they would come out for that. Or a pig roast, you know, you'd have to roast a whole pig and, and have, you know, hay wagon Sunday. Or you'd have to do these great big promotions and make a great big deal out of it. You know, I remember swallowing goldfish and dr dressing up in a monkey suit like a gorilla and taking whipped cream pies to the face, all to get these kids to come ride this bus. And the whole thing was just so that we could, <laughs> that's, that's quite the image, but it was just to get these people to come out, you know, and that, that was the whole point. But is that really what we've been called to do, is just reach children? Just to bring them out and, and show them, you know, some flannel graph of Jesus in a dress? And that's what's taking place when you get them into these junior churches. And just have, and sing a bunch of crazy and wild songs and, and just act, you know, goofy and, and try to teach them a little bit of Bible. No, it was to, it's, the, 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 the Great Commission is to go out and preach the gospel. It's to go out and reach lost souls with the good news that Jesus Christ has died for their soul. And if they don't want to hear it, then, and then moving on to the next one. But that's one of the major or inefficiencies with the bus route, is that you're targeting a very narrow audience, specifically and on purpose, with no intent of reaching the others. That you're trying to bring them out for the sole purpose, I believe, of getting their families to come out and build a church. And that's what it seems like a lot of Baptist pa uh, pastors are obsessed with today, is filling a church house. That's, that's their main goal, is to build a large building and then to fill it with people. You know, and that's not that's that's a great thing, you know, but that should be a byproduct of a ministry, I believe. I believe that when we the, when a when a ministry's sole focus is going out and reaching the lost, you know, people who have a zeal for God will come naturally. And isn't that what we see taking place here at Faithful Word? I mean, yeah. I remember when we, we were at a church in back home in, in Michigan that we were just, you know, we saw and heard about Faithful Word and saw the great works that they were doing as far as soul winning. And we're, deep, we're, I mean, we're just neck deep in the bus route. And, and, you know, one of the knocks on me when I left that church is that, you know, my heart wasn't in the ministry. But it's hard to be, have your heart in a ministry like that when you know how inefficient it is. Right. When you know it's not even accomplishing the task that you've been put on this earth to do, yeah, which right. is to reach people with Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then you look out and you see another church in another part of the country that has no bus route, yet it's going out and knocking doors and re leading people, lost souls, to Jesus Christ, saving people from hell. Amen. It's hard to have a heart for a ministry that, that doesn't accomplish that you know, in, in an efficient manner. Now, were there kids that got saved in that bus route? I absolutely believe there were. You know, but it was, we could have easily, just as easily given them the gospel at the door the first time you met them, Amen. rather than drag them out, you know, kicking and screaming sometimes. <laughs> parents, because I'll tell you what, one of the parents... When you come knock on a parent's door who has no control over their children, just an average person, person in the world that just, is just trying to get by, and you say, hey, I'm from such and such Baptist church. We're coming through every Sunday with a big bus route, a big bus picking up all the kids' neighborhood, and we'll take them off your hands for four to six hours. We'll do it every Sunday for free. All they hear is blah, 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 free babysitting, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? And that's exactly what happens, and that's their mentality. And, you know, and you, I, I guess I can understand where they're coming from. You know, if, if you were in that position, you, you know, lost without God in the world and just trying to look for, you know, a break from your kids that you hardly have any control over. But, you know, it just, it, 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 it's, it's very discouraging when you're picking up and putting all this effort into just picking up children. And then you come back and, you know, the parents are just been smoking weed all afternoon. You know, they just been, that's what they do. They just want their alone time to just, you know, hang out and do their thing. You know, and party a little bit. So that's one of the major problems. That's one of the major inefficient forms of evangelism that we see in Baptist churches today. And uh, 
you know, that's just the bus calling. You know, that and that alone is a lot of work. I mean, you're putting in eight, ten hours of bus calling sometimes if you're serious about getting it to grow. If you really want to have a big bus route, it takes a lot of, of going out on Saturday. <laughs> so now you've got a guy, you know, say he's got a family. You know, he's, he's there Sunday morning, Sunday night. He's there Wednesday night. Now he's giving up his Saturdays to go out and do and do bus calling, you know, and something that he just kind of feels like you, know, you end up feeling like you're just spinning your wheels. You know, you're not really getting any, anything done other than bringing a bunch of kids in. Now the other thing is that Sunday morning comes, you know, and you're bringing these kids in. You can't just get on a bus with about you know a few dozen kids and not do anything. They will eat you alive. They will. They will tear that thing apart. These kids that are coming out of the world with little to no discipline, no respect for anything, they will, they will chew you up. So when you get on that bus route on Sunday morning, you have got to be one animated and interesting individual. Otherwise, it's just you're getting fed to the sharks, pretty much. And you know, so you have to come up with all these programs and the games and the songs. And you know, sometimes my wife, she was on, on the bus route with me, she'll bring up one of these songs and I just can't, I can't do it anymore. You know, these songs that we've sung a hundred times every Sunday. I've been right up, right up, right down, right happy. Oh, you see some, you know what I'm talking about. All these crazy, wacky songs don't have nothing to do with, with, the, with Jesus Christ or anything that you've got to do just to entertain these kids for hours. And kids today, I'm telling you, they're hard to entertain. Kids out of the world, I mean, they've got Xboxes and Playstations and 3D movies that they get to go to and laser tag and all this crazy stuff that their parents take them to. And now just some guy in a suit's going to get up and try to sing a song about some Bible story. You know, you, it, it's hard. you got to have lasers coming out of your eyes and fire and there's got to be neon light. It's just, if you're not an energetic individual, it just doesn't, it takes a lot of energy is what I'm getting at. You're expending a lot of energy but you're not getting a lot in return. It's very inefficient. So that's just, then you're getting them to the church. And then, you know, that's really when a lot of the stuff goes. And if you would turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, it's when you finally get to the church that you start to see some of the, how unbiblical it is. You know, how, how um, even, I would even say anti-biblical. Not just that it's a poor and inefficient model, but it actually goes against certain scriptures. It actually it'll creates opportunity for people to go against scripture. And that would be with women teaching. And this is something that, that they go back and forth on. There's a lot of you know clever ways to kind of reason their way around clear scripture. Okay, so you're bringing these kids in, you know, and I would get a 45 minute reprieve once I got the kids to the church. I get to go to adult Sunday school class while the children went to all their Sunday school classes. And every single one of them was taught by a woman. And then after that, I would come into the junior church. Now, women are not to, to speak in church. They are not to teach right. in church. That's what it says there in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first born, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now this is something that I've even seen women Sunday school teachers bring up to a pastor and say, is this right for me to be teaching these children? You know, and, and these pastors have a lot of clever ways to go around. First of all, they say, well, since I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to assume authority over the man. So, but they'll say, well, you know, that's just saying they suffer not to teach or, or assume authority of a man. Saying it's not right for her to teach a man. Now that's right, she's not right to teach man, but is that really what that verse is saying? I mean, you, if you go in it with that preconceived notion that it's okay, then you can make it, it'll sound that that's what he's saying here. Suffer not a woman to teach, nor to super authority of a man. But wouldn't it read, but I suffer not a woman to teach, or to teach a man, or, or to or to you super authority of a man? Is it really speaking to the same person there, that, that they're not to teach men? Or is it she's just not to teach at all? I tend to think that she's just not to teach. I mean, who, if there's men in a church, are they supposed to leave the room when she's supposed to teach? Okay, but let's say, let's give it, let's give them that. Let's say, you know what? It, it says not to suffer, suffer not a woman to teach, nor to super authority of a man. She's not to teach a man. It's not that she's just not supposed to teach. Let's give them that. Let the woman learn in silence is the first, that's the preceding verse. So she's supposed to be silent in the church, right? So it's perfectly okay for a woman to teach children as long as she does it silently. 
You know, I guess, and I, you know what? I'm sure there's some Sunday school curriculum out there that makes that possible. That there's some kind of, you know, flannel graph or I don't. I just always go back to flannel graph. That's the only one I can remember. Maybe she get a whiteboard. Yeah, do some sign language. You know, I don't know. Pre-record it and play it. I don't know. But it says that she's to learn in silence. But I suffer not a woman to teach, comma, nor to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. Why? Why is that? Is it because Paul just had a bad attitude towards women? Is it just because he didn't like women? You know, just he got tired of all the nagging. Right? No, that's, sorry, I'm going to get in so much trouble. No, that's not the case. Adam was first formed, then Eve. And, the, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived be, being in the church. You ever wonder why women are not to teach? It's because it says that the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And, you know, it's not popular opinion today, but the fact is the Bible makes it clear that women are more easily deceived than men. Right. They're more easily right. led astray by the devil because they are the weaker vessel. You know, they have, and there's more feelings involved. And they're, they're, it's harder for a woman to draw a hard line in the sand and say, no, this is right, that is wrong, this is false doctrine, you know, and, 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 and let the, the Bible speak for itself and draw that hard line where it draws it. Amen. A woman wants to kind of blur that line out of sake of sparing people feelings, you know, out of, out of emotion that is involved. Right. That's why women should not teach, and I believe that they shouldn't even be teaching uh, children in the setting of a church, period. They just shouldn't be doing it. Because what if, what if the, that curriculum, or their, in their own studies, if they get something wrong, they're more easily led astray. It's more easily, you know, it's easier for them to, to teach false doctrine. It's easier for them to be deceived and to teach something that's false. I, I think of Sunday school teachers back in the church that I was involved with. They all had Schofield. One, I know one in particular had a Schofield. And I remember once even going up and saying, do you know that teaches the gap theory in Genesis 1? And then just getting this, this just deer in the headlights look. But kept writing that school field. And that was the Sunday school teacher. Am I now women are very good at it. You know, they have a knack. I think that they are very good at dealing with children. They can teach children. Because they should be teaching their own children. Right, right. You know, that's that's where a woman can teach children. That's where she can teach doctrine, and that's where the father can keep an eye on the doctrine that's being taught and, right. and can and can stand up and you know and and correct where correction is needed and encourage where encouragement's needed. But they're not to be teaching in a, in a church setting. Well, let's say it's not church. That's the next one. Well, there, it's not church. Then why are you doing it? Then why are we even having this service if it's not church? And it, it really is a church when you think about it. I mean, it's in the church building. You know, it's, it's the Bible being taught. Right. But it doesn't really feel like, like church because it, in a way it is a church. That's kind of a convenient excuse to say, well, it's okay for the women to teach in church because this isn't really church. Well, I thought we were picking up the kids to bring them to church. You know, it's just, a, it's just this weird, convoluted way that they have to, because they have to keep this bus route. Right. Because it's all they have. Because they think that this is the end-all, be-all of evangelism. And it's not. It's one of the biggest inefficient, the biggest wastes of time in Baptist churches. And I know that's going to rub people the wrong way. And it's something, you know, it's like the sacred cow that we can't go after for something. <laughs> because of the fact that it is, for, you know, and I'm hesitant to do it because in some churches, that is all they have. Right. That's the only form of outreach they have at all. That's right. And if you start going after it and you know try to take that away from them, they got nothing. But they still have to come to terms. If you can get these people to understand, look, this is not an efficient use of your energy and your resources right. to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it, it opens yourself up for, I believe, unbiblical practices in the church of allowing women to teach and to and to teach doctrine. And if you would. Uh, I'll just read to you 1 Corinthians 14. Let the women keep silence in the churches. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For as women, it is shame for women to speak in the church. And the problem is, is that a lot of these proponents, they mistake. You know, another, another big thing is they, they another excuse for bringing, having these bus routes is they mistake the church for Jesus. You know, Because I've asked them, and let me explain what I mean by that. I remember when I was first uh, getting involved in the bus route, I don't even know who this person was. I can't remember. But I said that I talked to him about it, and they said, well, that's unbiblical. And at the time, I was just taking it back. Like, how could that be unbiblical? And I remember I, I said, you know, I went to my pastor and said, hey, you know, so-and-so said this is unbiblical. You know, and I, and I remember reading and thinking, well, where is it in the Bible? I mean, surely if this is something we're doing in the church, then 
we're going to find some kind of biblical example of, of doing such a thing. And they never have that. They'll just turn to like, well, D.L. Moody did it. Huh? Huh? He used to ride a wagon around and pick up kids in the, you know, the suburbs or the ghettos of Chicago or something. You know, there's some story, but they could never take you to a verse. Well, my pastor, he had a verse, and it was in Mark 2. Mark 2, if you want to turn there quickly, Mark 2. So this is, this is the only text verse I've ever seen for a bus route. It's in Mark 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 1. And again he entered into Capernaum, and after some days, and after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. That's the bus route. It's when somebody, that's, it's one who could not get himself to Jesus, was born of four. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're like that one that's, you know, burying the others. We're the one that's, we're, the, we're one of the four that are going on burying that, that, that poor child who has no other means to get to Jesus. But the problem is, is you're mistaking church for Jesus. Yeah. Right. You're not bringing them to Jesus. You're bringing them to church. Right. You're not even bringing them to church. You're bringing them to some woman that's going to show them a picture of Jesus with long hair and a dress. That's what you're doing. It, it, that, and that, but this is their text verse. And it sounds good. It appeals to the emotion. But it's not correct. It's incorrect. If you were, if you wanted to be one of the four, well, you go as you knock on that child's door and ask them, hey, if you die today, you should go to heaven, and you give them the gospel. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And if they received it, great. And if they didn't, that's unfortunate. And you try to reach that whole house with the gospel. Right. That's how you bring somebody to Jesus. It's not going out on a bus route with candy and games and, and silly songs and getting them to a church. That's not bringing people to Jesus. It's a very... It could be... It may be a really long way to get somebody to Jesus. Huh? You know, it's taken a long route, the, the, the scenic route to get there. But why? It's inefficient. That's the point of the sermon. If the whole point is to t give the child the gospel, you're there, they're there, you got the Bible in your hand, what are you waiting for? You know, what, do you, what is it? Why do you have to pick them up, cart them around, you know, cook them chocolate chip pancakes, you know, pancake Sunday? once a month and just to convince him to come out and then maybe you'll get around to preaching the gospel after you explain Noah's Ark and you know Jericho and Daniel in the lion's den and all these exciting stories that are just to make him want to learn the Bible maybe you'll finally get around to preaching them the gospel you could do it right there at the door yeah right bringing them, bearing one who is unable to get to Jesus means just preaching them the gospel that's how you bring someone to Jesus now, I will say this, the numbers are accurate. If you were to say this is the bus route, the, the ratio there seems about right to me. It takes about four people to every one. You know? <laughs> the, the, the one we use, like ideal, the ideal bus route ratio I heard was one worker for every ten children, which we did not have, <laughs> by the way. I mean, I did a junior church that had, I had everyone from uh, five years old to 12. I had like 60 30 to 60 kids sometimes. And a lot of times it was just me. And this is after two hours of bus calling and an hour and a half of junior church with all these kids and then right back onto a bus to drop them all off. Boy, you, you seem a little burnt out. <laughs> and I remember the pastor coming and saying, you do more, you reach more of the people than I do. You talk to more people out in the streets than I do. And I just thought to myself, well, that's a shame. You know, that's, that's, that's a knock on you. Yeah. You know, it's too bad you got a guy going out who's spending, you know, Six, seven, eight hours on a Sunday, you know, carting people around, and uh, and you don't do anything, you know. But you, 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 I mean, I was doing more preaching than them on Sundays, you know, hour and a half on the bus on the way back. I'm preaching three services, you know, <laughs> in the course of eight hours. And I, I, in respect to any, after starting this, I mean, anybody who's who's done any preaching knows what a drain it is on your mind. It's unbelievable. Um, so nothing but respect for anybody who gets up and preaches. I have a lot more having started doing this. But, you know, that's one of the biggest inefficient, and I'll move on to another subject, um, another inefficient means of evangelism. We kind of picked on the bus route. But, uh, you know, the, the last thing I'll say about the bus route is this, is that, you know, kids can easily be saved at the door, just right. as they can, you that's know, right. after a three-hour bus ride. That's right. They can, they can be just as easy to say that the first time you meet them right at the door, you don't have to develop this, you know, this bond with them. You can preach in the gospel. 
And I'll say this is that parents, you know, it's unfortunate because parents rarely will take on the responsibility to bring their children to church. Right. Even if, as soon, you know, I've heard this statement, I believe this is very true. People will stay, some people, you can carry them, but wherever you put them down, that's where they're going to stay. They will never take it upon themselves to start to go forward for themselves. And that's what it is with children. If where you, wherever you stop, that's where they're going to stay. And, and a lot of times, because of their situation, they're going to go right back to where they were. They're going to fall right back in, into the world because their parents are worldly. They're pumping, you know, at home. There's more getting pumped in at home than we can pump out in an hour and a half at church. You know, they got how many hours of the week in front of a, a television and the yeah, internet right. and their parents, you know, just filling their minds with this stuff. And we're going to try and get that out of them. It's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. That, it's a losing battle. Right. You know, and of course, the great victory in a lot of Baptist churches is if you can get a bus kid to go to Bible college, then you've really, and you get him to vote Republican, you've really accomplished that. <laughs> that is like the monumental achievement for God. If you can take this ghetto kid, get him on a bus route, and get him to Bible college and become Republican, and, and, a, and, a, and, another, and a bus worker, you know, and just turn it. Anyway, I'm going off on it. I'm going to move on because I, I can stay on there too long. The next major inefficient. Inefficient means of evangelism is street preaching. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one. I think it probably, the clock's broken this morning, so, you know, you might just have to cut me off. But the street preaching is, uh, is another one. And this is, I don't know in terms of popular, if this is more or less popular than bus routes. It's probably, you know, comparable. But there's just, I mean, street preaching is incredibly inefficient. Number one, it's usually practiced by heretics. Right. First of right. all, I mean, right out of the gate. Yeah. I mean, they don't even have the gospel right. Right. You know, I learned uh, there was a guy that came and visited our church here uh, this last Wednesday night. And by visit our church, I mean he showed up like 20 to 30 minutes after the service had ended. And he's standing in the back with his friend. And they're kind of, they have this, that, like, this look, real nervous looking guys. So I went up and introduced myself and shook his hand. And, and, you know, and he just was all smiles and friendly. He kept asking for Pastor Anderson, like is he, or not even asking. He was like, and he was addressing him by his first name. Was Steve here? I said, no, Pastor Anderson has left already. You know, oh, okay. Well, I really wanted to stop and say, see, see Steve. You know, and that's a red flag to me. Whenever there's a guy just, then I thought, okay, maybe it's just one of these guys. It's just YouTube and yeah. decided to crawl out of his mom's basement. I mean, he looked like a slob, and decided to come, you know, check out his his idol church or something. But you know. It's, Pastor Anderson was gone, and he just went once. But the thing is, once I told him that, he got. It seemed like he got real relaxed, and he's like, "Oh, well, do you mind if we kind of walk around, check the place out?" I'm like, "No, go ahead. Do you mind if we take some pictures?" Yeah. And then somebody on Facebook points it out that this guy turns out to be a, some uh, Calvinist who was there to. Uh, and he said, "He's like, well, I was leaving town. And I thought I'd just stop by and, and take and check it out here wow. before I go." So, and he was from out of town, but. He, he shows up, and so I went to his Facebook page, and it's just him mocking, posting the pictures that he took there, and then just mocking Pastor Anderson, calling him names, and just going on about, you know, how, how, what a big man he was to have snuck in there. So it wasn't, it wasn't even really, it wasn't even really like a, a visit, it was like a publicity stunt. And he's one of these, like, street preachers, but you want to know the real irony about this? This is like one of the greatest ironies in life that you'll find. He's a Calvinist. A Calvinist street preacher. Talk about irony. I mean, honestly, what, what good is it? If you're a Calvinist and you think God just you know, picks people at random, who's going to be saved and who isn't? That he's, God's going to condemn some to hell and save others. What point is there you going out talking about it? What point is it you go out and tell people, you know, some of you are elect, some of you aren't. <laughs> I don't know which one's which, but God does. I mean, what are you going to yell at these people? You don't even have the right gospel. So that's one of the major inefficiencies of street preaching is these people that, I mean, if you're a Calvinist, I mean, good night. I think you've got better things to do with your time, like drink whiskey and watch James White videos or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the thing about Calvinism is you couldn't talk about anything more unbiblical. The Bible says that, in 2 Peter 3, that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, who are not willing that any should perish. So it says right there that God is not willing that any should perish. Amen. That verse flies in the face of Calvinism. That's right. It flies in the face of it. And I'm sure they've got some cute, clever way to work their ways around these, these verses, but it says He's not willing 
that any should perish. God wills nobody to hell. Right. Amen. Now God does send people to hell after if they reject the gospel, if they die in their sin. Right. He says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Not some, not the elect, not the few, not the chosen as a Calvinist, but that all would come to repentance. God doesn't want any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Another verse would be 1 Timothy 4.10, for, for, for therefore we both labor, labor and suffer reproach. Why do we labor? You know, why do we do all the work? Why do we suffer reproach? Why do we suffer you know, the mocking and the ridicule of the world? Because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. That's why we labor, because we know that God died for everybody, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially right. of those that believe. So e even the unbeliever, the one who chooses not to believe, Jesus Christ is still their Savior. Yeah. They just rejected it. That's the yeah. difference. Right. That's right. So I don't, you know, if you're going to be a street preacher, you should at least get that out. <laughs> Another one, you know, if they're not Calvinists, or they repent of the sins, guys. Yeah. And that's the, probably the majority of them. Yeah. Turn and burn! You know, they're out there just, you know, repent! <laughs> they don't even know, they just got this convoluted idea of what repent means. You know, it's always they have to just, people have to fall upon their face in sackcloth and ashes and call out to God in, in a contrite spirit if they're going to be saved. But it's the wrong Gospels. So, um, if you would turn to Isaiah chapter 42, I'll, I'll show you how, um, it's, again, an inefficient, not only a street preaching, inefficient means of evangelism, but it's also unbiblical. There is no biblical model for spreading the gospel in such a manner. You won't find that means of evangelism in the Bible. Another major problem with them, why it's so inefficient, is that they preach to captive masses. The people, a captive audience, people who have, you know, they had no intention of hearing Bible preaching. They'll say, well, Jesus was a preacher. He, he went out and he did open air street preaching. Yeah, but he preached to people who came and gathered. Yeah. Well, I remember when Jesus said, you know, you looked and beheld the multitudes a sheep having no shepherd, and his, he had compassion on them, and then he began to preach unto them. They were following him. They weren't going. They weren't at the mall, you know, or at some parade somewhere, or at a concert, trying to go about their own lives and have Jesus just show up and start yelling at them, you know, insisting that they stop what they're doing and listen to him. No, they, he, they, he did not have a captive audience. He didn't have people that had no choice but to listen to him. You know, that, that they were being inconvenienced. They were willingly sitting down and listening. Just as you guys have come here this morning and sat down and heard the preaching of the Word of God. I didn't show up to your door with, you know, hold you at gunpoint and force you to come to church this morning so you'd have to listen to me. Right? And that makes it, when you preach to people who don't want to hear it, and when you, these guys go out and just start, you know, go downtown in some busy city and start yelling at people who are you know, in the middle of the work week trying to get to the bank and their, and their work and on their lunch break and just start preaching. And you know, a lot of times, again, preaching the wrong gospel. It makes them unreceptive. It turns people off to the, to the things of God. Right. It spoils the well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've literally seen this. When I first moved to Phoenix, I had to get a second job driving and delivering pizza in East Mesa <coughs> over at Country Club in Southern. And every, about every other Friday night during the summer, this Pentecostal church would go out and they would stand on the corner of Country Club and Southern, this busy intersection, and do street preaching, open air preaching. And I, and I, my, you know, the store I worked out of, the Pizza Hut, was right there, so I had to drive by it multiple times. And I remember just looking, like listening to him, just like you couldn't even hear what the guy saying. He's preaching at a traffic light. <laughs> the people are in their cars in the summer in Phoenix. Do you think they have their windows down? Do you, I mean, how, talk about ridiculous that is. They can't, you couldn't even hear the guy. You know, and I, I didn't even have a radio on. Yeah, that's what it is. You just all you hear is like, you know, it's like, this is, you can't even make out what he's saying. You have to roll down your whistle, your, your window and really listen and try to decipher what he was saying. Talk about an inefficient means of evangelism. Probably didn't have the right gospel. Never, never bothered to find any of that out. And I just remember how odd it was because they, there was one guy and then they'd have like some of the people that came out, they'd have like about a dozen people and the whole time they're just back there going, <laughs> clapping while he's out there just, <laughs> just, and a lot of times it was just him going off about what, you know, how great God was for taking away all his sins or something like that. I tried to listen a few times, but I remember just shaking my head like, what a, what a stupid way to try to yeah. reach people with the gospel, even if you've even got it right. And can you imagine if that's what we were to do here, like Pastor Anderson started a new 
you know, traffic light ministry here at Faithful Word, where we're just going to go out on Friday nights, and we're all going to clap, and we're going to yell at people as they're driving by in their cars. I mean, at the best, they might catch, like, how long is a, a traffic light? Yeah, maybe. You know, that's a long trip. Where have you been? <laughs> when it turns green, you go, brother. <laughs> You're that guy that's always getting honked at. No, it's like, you know, maybe what? Maybe a minute? 30, 45 seconds? Maybe there's that three minute one out there. I've never seen it, but it could be. You know, so, so you're out there and uh, you might catch, okay, three minutes of, a, of what? You know, can you give the gospel in three minutes? If you can, you're really good, and you're probably. But the fact is, you're probably not giving a very good gospel presentation. Right. So the point is, is, street preaching is just completely inefficient. It's a it's a terrible way to try and evangelize anybody. And there in Isaiah 42, in verse one, it's speaking of Jesus Christ. Behold, my servant, whom I shall whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighted. I have put my spirit upon him, and shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. Does that sound like a guy? Does that sound like a street preacher to you? I mean, that's exactly what a street preacher does. And they try to say, well, that's what Jesus did. No, the Bible says he will not cause his voice to be heard in the streets. Jesus does not go around randomly yelling at passersby. That's not what he did. Now, he would go and he would, he would lift up his voice at times, but that was not the main, his main form of evangelism. He would go out and he would try to, and, and, and he would send his disciples a lot of times to go out. And that's, we're going to look at that in a minute. So the, he, it's, we see the opposite of, of street preaching as the model that Jesus set. Another one, I'll just touch on this. Another major inefficient form of evangelism would be tract ministries. And if you think that's an efficient form, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> because that is not. And I've been involved, I've had people come to churches that I've been a part of and present their gospel ministry of, of, of sending cargo loads of, of Bible tracts. I've spent hours, hours handing out Bible tracts. Yeah. At, in Traverse City, where I'm from, the National Cherry Festival, we have like, I can't remember, like 3 million people come through this town of like maybe 60 or 70,000 people in one week. It's the National Cherry Festival every summer. It's a, it's, a, it's a festival that goes on, been going on for 100 years, over 100 years. People come from all around the area and they come through our, the city. And, and a lot of times our church would go out and try and just hand out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gospel tracts. And I remember when I was doing that, you know, just I would go, I would go around the corner and collect them, the ones that were, you know, on the top of the trash can. Because that's what people do. They take the track, they look at it, first trash can they find, boom. Or they stick it in their pocket and they go home and they throw it out there. It very rarely gets read. But even then, is that going to get them saved, just reading a gospel track? Is there, don't you need somebody there to preach the gospel to you? Right. To explain to you? I mean, are you just trusting that they're going to understand what the Bible is saying? That, you, know, it, you know, understand without readers? How can I, except some man should explain, you know, should, should, should uh, how's it go? Should tell me. Yeah. So they need to be, so, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on gospel tracks. They're, that's a huge waste. But that's what a lot of people do. They feel good because they've, you know, they donated X amount of dollars to some gospel tract ministry. Or they went out and, brother, I handed out 100 gospel tracts today. Praise the Lord. You know, I did my service for God. I've evangelized. It's inefficient. So we see, you know, but I will say this. You know, all of these are obvious. These examples that I've given are, are incredibly inefficient. But the, the most inefficient thing for evangelism is not doing any at all. Yeah. And at least in some of these, there's an off chance that maybe somebody will get saved. Yeah. Maybe somebody will read that gospel. I know I read a gospel track and didn't understand it, but it made some, some form of an impression on I me. Mean, got me thinking about Jesus Christ, at least. I'll give it that much. You know, but it took somebody taking the Bible and opening it up and explaining, going through the Romans road, and showing me that I'm a sinner, that Jesus died for my sins, and that I need to you know, call upon Him in faith. That's, that's how people get saved. But there is some... There could be a grain of, of truth and goodness in every one of these. You know, the bus ministry probably more than the others. It could be that there's a street preacher out there who isn't a Calvinist, who isn't preaching repent of your sins heresy, and actually gets somebody to stop and roll down their window, maybe park the car, and listen to what you have to say. You know, or, or, or you could take a side. I'm sure that happens. But I didn't say it's, it's completely, you know, 
unaffected. I said it's it's inefficient. It's not an efficient means of of evangelizing. But the worst of all is not doing anything. Yeah. And you know, and I'd be a real hypocrite to get up here and criticize these other met methods if I did nothing. Yeah. And that's why a lot of these other methods they don't receive any criticism from pastors because they themselves are doing nothing. Yeah. And that's the worst of all, you know. And, and and if you're the person who's not doing any soul winning, well, you know, shame on you. Right. We need to be out there. We need to be doing soul winning and doing right. it efficiently. Now, going door to door. Let me just conclude. Going door to door soul winning. Let's talk. We've talked about the inefficient. Let's talk about the most efficient means. Is door to door soul winning. Going to each home in a in a city and knocking on their door, in hopes that they'll come to their door and allow you. And not, not sit there and compliment the lawn or their sweater and talk about the game, but get right into it. Hey, if you got today, are you 100% sure you can go to heaven? You know, confront them with the gospel. It takes boldness and it takes, right. you know, it takes some spirituality and it, and it takes, but you know what? It's the most efficient means to do it. And not only that is it the most effective, it's also the most biblical. It's the one method that we were talking about this morning that we could actually go to the Bible and see clear verses. And see clear scripture teaching us, and, and that's the model that's been set forth in scripture. If you would turn to Matthew chapter 9, you see, in Mark 6, you turn to Matthew 9, but in Mark 16, Jesus said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's a big task. Yeah. He said, The whole world. He said, Every creature. You know, a few months back, Pastor Anderson got up, preached that gospel, that uh, sermon about evangelizing the whole world. And I know some people were kind of taken aback, like, wow, that's, that's a little over the top. No, that's the vision Jesus Christ had. That's right. That's exactly what He said in Scripture. Reach the whole world. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's the Savior of all men. So is it any surprise that He wants us to reach the whole world? And if is, is, he, just, is, is he just, you know, some dreamer, Jesus Christ, He's just hoping for the best? Or is there actually a way where we could reach the whole world? Now, why would he give us a charge like that and not give us a means to do it? He didn't say, you know, it's not like God just said, you need to reach everybody, and then just didn't give us any means to do it. He didn't give us any clue on how to accomplish that goal. And we have very clear scriptures that tell, tell us that yeah. we're how to do it. So would it make sense that God, if God gives us that charge to go out and reach the whole world, that, that, uh, that we would go to where people are? <laughs> Think about it. It's not that. It's a logical thought. And where are people most available and, and have, you know, and most inconvenienced in their home? I mean, you catch me at home, you, you probably pull me off the couch. You know, I wouldn't probably do You know, you could, especially like on a Sunday afternoon, the average guy. You know, what's, what are they doing on a weekend? People are relaxing. If you can catch them at home where they're likely to be, Obviously, you know, people are out and about, but if you, can, if you keep going and keep going, yeah. you can try and reach everybody. You, you'll reach yeah. them. We just, it's a numbers game. I mean, if we had half the city of Phoenix soul winning, we'd reach everybody. Yeah, it's right. just that there's nobody to go. Right. You know, the harvest truly is great. It's the laborers that are few. Yeah, right. You know, many hands make light work. We just right. need more laborers. Yeah. We could, it's not a, it's not a far-fetched concept. It's just that people don't want to do it. Yeah. Now, it's the example that Jesus set going door to door, Matthew 9. Matthew 9, 35, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the multitudes. So you see right there, Jesus went to all the cities and the villages. Does that mean he just went down to the town square and stood there? No, he went there and, and, and preached to individuals. He went there and preached to people. And, and people were able to hear. It's the example of the, of the apostles in Luke 10. After these things, the Lord appointed seventy also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither himself he would come. And then he gives them this charge of verse 3, Go your ways, behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And in whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house, and if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not... It shall turn to you again, and in the same house remain eating and drinking such thing as they give. So get the get the what he's saying. He's saying you're going to go into these cities, and the first house that receives you, that's where you're going to basically set up shop. That's what I believe he's teaching here. 
Because it goes on and says, and this is this is the part of the verse that you know Baptists would love to cling to these days. Verse seven: In the same house remain eating and drinking such thing as they have for the laborer worthy worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. See it right there. It says, "Go not from house to house." Is that what he's saying here, though? No, he's saying, "Don't go from house to house to get your needs needs met. Don't go from house to house looking, you know, because he says the laborer is worthy of his hire." You know, in the same house remain, the house that receives you first, remain in that one, eating and drinking such things as, as, are, as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire, go not from house to house. Don't go into the city and treat it like a buffet, is what he's saying, you know. <laughs> go to one restaurant, sit down, that's where you're going to eat. That's where you're setting up shop, that's going to be your headquarters. Right. That's where you're going to go. And to whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat each su each such things as, they, as you are set before you. So he's saying you go to that house, and if the city receives you, if if, they're, if it's a receptive city, you know whatever that house is going sets before you, that eat, you know, and go not from house to house. But if the city does not receive you, then you're to, you're to leave. So it's not that he's saying just go to one house in the city, you know. It, it, anyway, I don't know. Hopefully, Pete, this makes sense because I know some people struggle. It says go not from house to house. That's not what it's saying there. It's, you know, it's the house that received them would be the house that provided them while they preached in that city. That's what that verse is saying. And they were to abide in that house if the city received them. Meaning, how would, how would you know if the city received you if you didn't go preach to it, if you didn't go door to door? Right. Acts 5.42, I'll read to you. And then daily in the temple and in every house, they cease, cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So if they were to not go from house to house, it's not very long that they're breaking that commandment. You know, where they, where they, are, where they are not... Where it says they are, they're, they're teaching and preaching Jesus Christ in every house. You know, they were saying, not house to house, well, they ended up going in every house. So that's the example in Acts 5, the early church. But Baptists today, they just think they've outsmarted God here. They've got a better way to do it. They've got a, a, a more friendlier way, a, a, just, a, just, a, just a better way to build the church. Just, it's just so much better. But it's the, the example is to go to every house. So how is how is door to door soul winning unbiblical? How that is the biblical model that we see in Scripture. It's the example of Jesus Christ. It's the example of the apostles, and it's the example of Paul. Here, there in Acts, turn over to verse twenty, Acts chapter twenty and verse eighteen. And when they were come to him, he said to them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you in, at all seasons. Acts twenty verse nineteen. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, and it but have showed you, and have taught you publicly, and from house to house. See, right now we're being taught publicly. We're at church. You know, we're hearing the preaching of the word of God. And later we're gonna go from house to house during our soul winning time. That's the example that we see in scripture. It's people going house to house. They're preaching the gospel to every creature, and really, that's you know, I don't, I don't. I, hopefully, I don't have to make too big of a case for soul winning. You know, it, right. it seems pretty clear to me. Right. I mean, at least this method has very clear scripture. You know, where whereas bus calling, they have one born of the four. Whereas the you know the the the, the street preacher, he's got a verse in Isaiah that's complete opposite of what he's doing. As the example of Jesus Christ. At least we have these clear scriptures. I mean, if you could think of a better way to reach the entire world, to reach every creature in all the world, the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm all ears. Let's hear it. But I, 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 I defy anyone to find a more efficient and effective method than door-to-door -door soul winning. So why isn't it getting done? Because it's the work of an evangelist. Right. It takes work. It takes right. dedication. Because, and it, because there's times where it is discouraging. People don't want to listen. People are rude to you at the door. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the last week we're out here, we went to this complex and it was, nobody was home. The ones that were home, they didn't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. But I'd let, that morning I preached that sermon about, you know, people going to hell. I remember walking out of here last Sunday thinking about that, just that, that, that thought of people being cast in the lake of fire. And how if we go out and this thought came, if we only reach one person today, if we go out and go soul winning, we only reach one person that's one less person who's going to be cast in the lake of fire. That's, right. that's one less person who's going to die and go to hell. That's right. So when we're out, then you know, that's people lose focus of that. And that's when we get discouraged. 
But if we go out there and, you know, door after door, and sure enough, last weekend, last Sunday, door after door, not home, not home, not home, don't want to hear it, don't want to hear it. But the last door I knocked, that person got saved. Amen. Amen. And so it's, you know, and I walked away rejoicing. And the Bible says, you know, that the angels were, were rejoicing in heaven over that one sinner that repented. You know, that one sinner that put their trust in Jesus Christ. That day, it makes it worth it. But that's not good enough for people that want to fill their building. It's not good enough for people who just want to pat themselves on the back without actually having to talk to anybody and confront them about their soul. Right. And that's, you know, that, that's the most efficient manner is, is doing the work of an evangelist. So that's what we should do. And I just want to close in Acts 21. You know, let's have the rep I want to look at a guy who had a reputation of being an evangelist. And that was Philip. And the next day... We were in verse eight, and the next day they, and the next day we that were of Paul's company departed and came into Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. So here's a guy. That's who's Philip? You know, the evangelist. You know, the guy who went out, and, and he, even even his daughters. And it says, and the man had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So even his family had people who went out and prophesied or preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's have that kind. Let's be known as that. Let's put our name in there. Instead of Philip the Evangelist, let's be so-and-so the Evangelist. Put your name in that spot. Could that be said of you, that you have that reputation of being an Evangelist? And if you are, then you're probably one who goes door-to-door -door soul winning. Because that is the most efficient means to go, and it's the biblical model that God has given us. Let's pray. And Father, again, thank you for the, the clear teaching of Scripture. Thank you for... Lord, that you've made salvation so simple and easy that one only has to just put their faith and trust in you and understand that, that uh, you died for them, Lord Jesus, and that you were buried and that you rose again. And Father, I pray you'd help every one of us to help have that reputation as, as Philip did, to be an evangelist. And Lord, that you help us not to be caught up in, in gimmicks or, or new and, and creative ways to try and reach the gospel of Jesus Christ, but that we would simply look to your word and see the example of Scripture of, of going door to door and of reaching an entire world, Lord, that if, if others would put aside these inefficient means, Lord, and, and get on board with the program that you've put up down, Lord, we could accomplish great things for you. We could accomplish that charge that you've given us to preach the gospel to every creature. And Lord, I just pray that you would uh, be with us now as we go our own ways and bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah.